This is the story of Harris Lawless. His friends and family called him Ed or Edward, so we will do the same. Ed was quite a fellow, as you will soon learn. His life began as the 19th century was coming to a close. September 13, 1892, in Emmett Township, South Dakota. The Enabling Act of 1889 had just passed, enabling the territory to become a state. The social issues of the day centered on prohibition and women's suffrage. To really understand Ed, we need to go back two generations to the land of Farty Shades of Green, Ireland. Lawrence Lawless, Ed's grandfather, hailed from Wexford a town in Southeast Ireland at the mouth of the River Slaney. Rexford has quite a history, a history that would long influence the Lavas family for generations. In 1169, the Norman invasion took place in Wexford. Wexford had received news of the approaching Norman army and prepared to fight the invaders on open ground outside of town. Upon learning the strength of the invaders, they instead burned their outbuildings, preventing the invading army from having cover. The town held its ground, but was forced to surrender with the next day's invasion. It has been said that the lawless surname came from the Normans, suggesting the clan's heritage rested from the Norman side of the conflict. Lawless was of the original tribe of Kilkenny, Then, on October 1649, English General Oliver Cromwell, as part of his conquest of Ireland, put Wexford under siege. Having secured the castle, he turned his guns on the town. Irish troops made a stand in the city center called the Bull Ring, but were quickly overwhelmed. By Cromwell's own estimates, 2,000 townsmen were killed. Then more slaughter rained on Wexford with the United Irish Revolt of 1798, a fight against English rule. Presbyterians, angry for being shut out of power by the Anglicans, joined Catholics and formed United Irishmen. Responding to the movement in June of 1798, over 13,000 British soldiers launched an attack on Vinegar Hill outside Wexford. It was the last attempt to defend ground against British troops and ended in a stunning Irish defeat. United Irish had been greatly influenced by the French Revolution. In honor of the French, Irish fighters cropped their hair short in a fashion similar to the French style and became known as the Croppies. Poet Seamus Heaney memorialized the Battle on Vinegar Hill in a poem called Requiem for the Croppies. The pockets of our gray coats full of barley no kitchens on the run, no striking camp. We move quick and sudden in our country. The priests lay behind ditches with a tramp. A people hardly marching on the hike. We found new tactics happening each day. We cut through reins and riders with a pike and stampede cattle into infantry. Then retreat through hedges where cavalry must be thrown until on Vinegar Hill, the final conclave. Terrace thousands died, shaking scythes at cannon. The hillside blushed, soaked in our broken way. They buried us without shroud or coffin. And in August, the barley grew up out of our grave. Lawrence was born in 1814, a mere 16 years from the 1798 Irish Rebellion. He married Mary McCurry Leach in Canada. She was from Northern Ireland in the town of Christendall. Mary was Irish Catholic. Lawrence was Protestant. Prior to his marriage to Mary McCurry, she had first been married to Michael Leach in Ireland. 
Mary and Michael, along with their four children, immigrated to Canada by schooner, a trip lasting 16 weeks. Tragically, just one month after arriving, Michael was killed by a falling tree. Lawrence and Mary met and married in Canada around 1851. The story goes that Lawrence had another wife at the time, name and particulars unknown. When Mary found out, she immediately kicked Lawrence out, although the story has never been proven. The Irish question and the resulting conflicts did much to shape Lawrence's awakening and evolution through those turbulent years. And it appears Lawrence's political activism was handed down to his son James and to his son Edward, the subject of our story. Lawrence and his son James made their way to South Dakota from Canada in 1871, seeking land made possible by the Homestead Act of 1862. Both filed a claim in Emmett Township, South Dakota. James had purchased wheat seed for his new stake, but it was stolen, forcing him to take a job on the railroad to re-earn his needed seed money. Around this time, James' future wife, Mary O'Connor, made her way with her brothers from Wisconsin and staked a claim in South Dakota as well. Eventually, the two would meet. James L. Lawless and Mary A. O'Connor were married on February 3, 1880 in Jefferson Union, South Dakota. James was 25, Mary 26. According to a 1900 federal census, Ed was age six, living with his parents and his sisters, Mary and Catherine, brothers John, Leo, and Michael. At age 17, records show him living on his father's farm as a farm laborer in Beersford, South Dakota. In the few years that followed, Edward met a Mary A. Ditterman, the daughter of Leo and Carolyn Jost Ditterman. They married on June 27, 1916 at St. Teresa's Catholic Church. Ed was 23, Mary 19. May, as she was often called, was described as one of our brightest and best young ladies possessed of all the graces and accomplishments desired for the modern home. And Edward, an industrious young man who bears the respect of all who know him. The wedding was no small event, it was reported that it concluded with a luncheon serving over 400 guests at midnight. Thirteen months later, the couple's first child, Cleo Marie, was born on July 2, 1917. Tragically, less than a year later, Cleo died of a heart condition. According to Ed's draft card, at age 23, he was listed as having black hair, brown eyes, medium height, and slender build, living in Prairie Union, South Dakota, raising stock. Evidence of Ed's inherited activism was displayed in his becoming a charter member of a branch of the Friends of Irish Freedom in December of 1919. He was elected corresponding secretary. The group was a national organization sponsored by the American Republican Organization that supported all causes promoting the national independence of Ireland. The Friends of Irish Freedom supported the 1916 Easter Irish Uprising, the most significant uprising in Ireland since the Rebellion of 1798 and the first armed action of the Irish Revolution period. The 1916 protesters took over the post office where the only local telegraph resided as a result, Americans learned of the uprising before England became aware. Ed's organization raised $350,000 for the Irish Relief Fund. Because Ed's organization circulated a petition containing several hundred thousand signatures calling for the independence of Ireland, President Woodrow Wilson directed the Secret Service to investigate the membership and funding of the organization. It is worthy of note that the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed in December of 1921, establishing an Irish free state. The treaty did not include Northern Ireland. The lawless household grew by one, 
when Ed and May welcomed the birth of Harris Edward Lawless on February 28, 1919. Around this time, Ed and May owned their own farm free and clear, which would serve them well as troubling times would later emerge. Then on October 11, 1920, the family of three became four with the birth of Robert James in Prairie Union, followed two years later in 1922 with the birth of daughter Mary Patricia. Sadly, a few years later, on November 2, 1923, Edward lost his mother, Mary Ann O'Connor, who died in Beersford, South Dakota. She was 70. Like many families in South Dakota during the 20s, the Lawless clan enjoyed attending aerial barnstorming shows. They witnessed Jenny Plains performing spins, barrel rolls, dives, and death-defying wing walks. The popularity of these events was heightened by Charles Lindbergh's first solo flight across the Atlantic in 1923. On January 20th, 1924, Ed and May welcomed child number four with the birth of James J. and Prairie Union. Three years later, though, Ed's father passed away at age 73 on December 17, 1927, in Sioux City, Iowa. This was followed two years later with Ed and May's fifth and last child, Lois Lawless. That year was not a good year for the nation, though. For beginning October 1929, the stock market crashed. It seemed it was time to pay for the over-exuberance of the 1920s as markets crumbled and many Americans lost their businesses, jobs, and life savings. Times were bleak. And yet despite this, the 1930 census described the 37-year-old Edward and 32-year-old May as having five children, ages 11 to less than a year, owning their own farm as an employer. The Lawless family enjoyed some immunity from the trials of many others. But thanks to their strong, charitable character, the Lawless family had a heart and cared for the plights of others. When neighbors took his chickens, Ed merely ignored the theft, believing their needs forgave the act. He organized fellow farmers to come to the aid of those whose farms were being foreclosed upon. They would attend the farm auctions and refused to buy the foreclosed farm until the bid reached a penny. Then a farmer would buy the farm at the reduced price, turning it back to its original owner. Entertainment during this period often focused on the electronic marvel of the day, radio. Like much of America, they would sit in front of this magic box and become transformed to dramas like The Shadow, A local entertainment center was Emmett Hall, where big bands were booked. The hall would feature a surprise band night. May was often disappointed, though, when on such a night they had to settle for an often heard familiar local band, Lawrence Welk. Glenn Miller was her favorite. Benny Goodman also played at the hall. Dances and midnight suppers were held every Friday night. Yes, Emmett Hall seemed to be entertainment central. Another example of the Lawless family character was evidenced by their housing of school teachers and their work hands with the Lawless children sharing rooms and beds. As was the case in most of rural America, education was delivered in one-room schoolhouses with all grades in attendance. The classic McGuffey readers directed most teachers' lesson plans. Examples of Ed's activism included his appointment as secretary of the Union County Farm Holiday Association. Here, he served to notify key farmers as to the status of farming strikes. Strikes would often occur when farm goods prices 
would drop below acceptable levels for fair livable margins. One such strike occurred when a meeting was taking place with Midwestern governors and representatives of the FDR administration. It involved the dumping of milk as milk prices had become seriously low. Ed also joined a group called the Civilian Protection Unit, formed by Colonel E.A. Beckwith, designed to meet local emergencies. 1933 and 34 began a busy period for Ed. In addition to becoming a member of the newly formed Credit Bank of Farmers, he served as a local sheriff for a four-year term. Being the local lawman had its moments. He was called upon to guard a road in which public enemy number one, John Dillinger, was rumored to be driving. Dillinger had quite a South Dakota crime record. He, along with Babyface Nelson, robbed the Securities National Trust Bank in Sioux Falls on March the 6th, 1934, gunning down a police officer and making off with nearly $50,000. Witnesses describe Babyface as standing on the bank counter with a machine gun. The census of 1940 showed Ed's family house to be valued at $2,500, with Ed working 52 weeks a year with an annual income of $636. A typical week found Ed working 60 hours. It showed Ed with two years of high school, May with four years, Bob at 19 and Mary at 17 with three years, James 15 with two years, and Lois aged 10 in the fourth grade. In the summer of 1941, a worrisome war was raging in Europe. The British appealed to Americans to conserve food to provide more to go to Britain's fighting men in World War II. The Office of Price Administration, OPA, warned Americans of potential gasoline, steel, aluminum, and electrical shortages. During this period, Ed responded to the challenge and became a clerk for the OPA. Then on December 7, America was no longer a mere witness to the threatening conflict overseas. The war came home with stunning and fatal clarity with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The word rationing now had special meaning to the daily lives of Americans. True to form, Ed joined the War Ration Board volunteering to inspect grain storage bins to help determine rationing needs. In 1944, Ed left the farm and moved to town, but he remained active. He served as Union County Chairman for the Democratic Party for a number of years, ending only with his death. A young George McGovern and his wife Eleanor would often type on his typewriter when McGovern first ran for office. The coveted typewriter remains in the family to this day. Ed also worked in real estate and was a real estate appraiser. Being active just seemed to be in his blood. This period did bring tragedy though. On December 10, 1954, his son Robert James was tragically killed while helping his uncle Joe Detterman fix a wagon wheel on a load of corn. The wagon fell on him and fatally injured the 34-year-old Robert. And it was a mere six years later on New Year's Day, 1960, that our story ends. Harris Ed Lawless dies of colon cancer at the age of 67 in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. May would follow him 10 years later. Ed's death revealed his importance to many as it brought forth a handwritten note of condolence from George McGovern. And tributes from South Dakota Attorney General Parnell Donahue and Governor Ralph Herseth. Yes, Harry Ed Lawless was quite a guy. No books had been written about him or movies produced to tell his story, but surely there could be. He was a man who never forgot his heritage.
his family. His country. He never turned away from his values and principles. He was a man worthy of remembrance. <laughs>